My name is Dara Badon. I take she, her pronouns, and I'm from the Office for the Arts at Harvard and Harvard's Dance Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. As a volunteer for this incredible convention of APAP, I am very pleased to personally welcome you all to APAP, New York City's 2023 conference. We, okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that, y'all. So we especially want to welcome new colleagues, of course, returning as well, to this session, Building More Equity in Contracting New Resources and Next Steps. We look forward to being engaged and challenged by your voices and perspectives as we build the future of APAP. Thank you all for joining us. As a quick visual description for myself, even though I will be exiting the stage shortly, my name, like I said, is Dara Badon. I have dark brown, black curly hair. I am a black woman of early 20s. Um, I wear glasses and I am wearing a red sweater with blue sleeves. Um, I'm going to be turning this over to Matthew Covey, who will be giving a land acknowledgement as well as leading this session. Oh, one quick thing. Uh, as you enjoy and sink all this information in on your way out, we have these QR codes posted to the door. They have a neon green uh, backdrop and a humongous QR code for your phone. If you don't mind scanning that and filling out the session survey, it would be really valuable to get your feedback. Um, and with that, turning it over to Matthew and I and the rest of APAP wish you all an exciting and expiring time. And as a reminder, Take care of yourself and take care of others. For you, Matthew. Awesome, thank you so much. That's a great way to start. Is this, does this sound okay? Is that good? Everybody in back, you can hear? Awesome, great. Um, I wanna start by acknowledging that we are meeting on the unceded ancestral land of the Lenape people. Um, and as, insofar as we can, pay respects to the, uh, their elders past and present um, and their stewardship of this land. Um, my name is Matthew Covey. I'm the executive director of Thomas Dot, which is an arts uh, service organization based here in Brooklyn uh, that provides assistance to the arts, international arts community regarding issues related to artist mobility. I'm also uh, an, an immigration attorney and the founding partner of an eponymous law firm. Uh, that serves the purposes of international artists uh, dealing with legal issues, sort of the, the nexus of uh, the arts and law. Um, I am a middle-aged white man, glasses, beard, turtleneck inspired by the Beatles documentary. Um, <laughs> And uh, so that, that's me. I think we're just gonna run down and do the introductions quickly. Oh, him, he, his are my pronouns. Um, let's just roll down and do quick introductions, self-introductions here, if that's okay. My name is Rika Eno, she, her, hers. Um, I'm a mother, entrepreneur, um, and founder and producer of Sozo. Um, I am an Asian woman of Japanese descent, I'm currently wearing a fake leather jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Michael Reed, he, his. Uh, I am from Arizona State University, ASU Gamage, the presenting organization. I am a white man with platinum hair, um, wearing a black, suit jacket and a dark uh, blue shirt. Uh, and let me just say, as a, a APAP board vice president, I am overjoyed to see you all here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Martha Redbone, she, her, hers. I am a singer, songwriter, vocalist, composer, um, educator, and I am African American and descendant, proud descendant of Eastern Band Cherokee Nation. And um, I am wearing uh, cobalt blue, um, dyed, freshly dyed hair. And, um, and I'm really honored to be here on this panel. 
Hi, uh, my name is Sandy Garcia. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am director of booking at Pentacle, so and uh, I am wearing a multicolored shirt. I guess purple, oh no, it's grayish blue and orange, and I'm just really excited that I get to sit next to Martha Redbone. <laughs> I'm Suzanne Callahan. I'm excited I get to sit next to Sandy Garcia. Um, <laughs> um, I am a consultant. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I am a white woman of a certain age wearing a gray blazer and fake blondish hair. Great, thank you all. Um, so we gather here today to sort of um, well, let me back up. I should have thought that first sentence better. Um, we had this pandemic thing, and as all of you know, one of the first things that happened when it became clear that everything was gonna shut down was lots and lots of cancellations happened. And when that happened, there was this little clause in many contracts that had gone unnoticed for centuries, which was the force majeure clause, which suddenly destroyed everyone's lives really abruptly. And uh, I don't want to make light of it. It was a really, I mean, I did, but it was a very cataclysmic moment and it <clears throat> caused a lot of people to, re to, to become much more aware of what was in contracts and it led to a whole lot of conversations throughout the, well, many industries, but certainly throughout the performing arts industry. Conversations about, first of all, what are the terms of these contracts that we've been signing and not reading for years? and what impacts do they have? And that kind of evolved into where do these, where do these contracts locate power? Um, so the initial conversations were about force majeure and how can we rethink what happens when there's a cancellation because of an act of God, of, uh, some sort of unexpected crisis? Are there ways that contracts can be made to be more equitable? Um, but that question, especially because it was being, we were in the process of talking about this question um, when shortly thereafter the George Floyd murder caused us to all be thinking about a lot of issues about the, with our artistic practice and all of our professional practices and our live practices. And that led to a lot of thought about ways that our values are embedded into the documents that we sign. And that has led to a whole series of conversations and organizations and efforts over the last two and a half years to dig back into the contracts and the ways that contracts and the business practices that surround them, ways that those reflect or fail to reflect the values that we have as a community. Um, myself, I kind of came a little bit late to this conversation um, because all the people to my left were the people that were deeply involved with this project from the outset. Um, so what we're doing today is we've arranged a series of questions that, re that dig into both where do we stand right now and thinking about the future of contracts and how they can be used as uh, for the forces of good and ways to push the envelope of equity in our practices, but also to bring, to kind of give a historical context to the conversations that have happened over the last two and a half years. Um, so there's a historical element and there's a uh, sort of best practices element and then there's also a piece which I think we'll get into more as we as the conversation evolves which is where could where is this going where is this conversation about how we use contracts where is it going and where could it go in the future um, I personally as a lawyer find this extremely exciting because I think that Obviously, I think of contracts as being sort of exciting to start with, because I'm a lawyer. Uh, and, but the idea that they could be used as a way to put teeth into our ethical, moral aspirations is a really compelling notion. And I love to see that this conversation is happening. Um, so thank you, APAP, for letting us do this. And thank you, all of you, all the folks who have been involved who are here at this table and a num certainly a bunch of other people who have been involved with uh, other organizations and with APAP over the last two years to bring this conversation to where it is today. Um, I wanna start with Sandy 
And I want to start with kind of a basic question. You were involved, you were in contract working groups at Creating New Futures and at Dance USA, um, which was where a lot of this conversation first came out of. And I'm wondering, can you tell us a bit about how each group approached the topic, the topic of contracts and contract practice and contracting? Um, what were the big things that you came up with with those working groups? And were there big differences between the groups and what they found? And um, Matthew, I'll say that the reason why we didn't approach you during the early phases of this yeah, work yeah, yeah. was, oh, the reason why we didn't approach Matthew during the early phases of this work was because he was also doing some really, really vital work with the international artists and visas at that time. Like, our whole industry was on fire during those, um, those early months. So we would have loved to have had you at that point. Now we're thrilled to have you in this conversation. I wasn't insulted at all. It was fine. <laughs> So um, when uh, we got together at Dance USA, it was really actually a natural uh, request that had come up from the presenters council and the agents, managers, uh, pro agents, managers, promoters, and producers. This happened around June of 2021, um, and actually the presenters had reached out to our group and said they wanted to have a conversation because they were concerned for our well-being, given what had been happening, our future as agents and managers, as well as the artists that we were representing. So we welcomed this conversation. Um, we had really, um, we had a call, a call and talked about how we were looking at force majeure and could we come together to create a group to address some of these issues that we were handling so that in the future, if this were to happen again, we would be able to survive because if this were to happen again, it would be catastrophic for everyone. Um, and also for presenters, they wouldn't have the agents and managers and the artists to bring. So, um, so because the, ultimately the group was formed by 19 agents, managers, and presenters, all of us contributed in the capacities that we could. And we dived into conversations on the contracts to see what was it that was um, sort of the, what were the main points that we really needed to address? And what we uh, agreed on, because they were from various organizations and coming from various perspectives, and we didn't always agree on everything, was that we were able to agree on three principles. One was that we wanted to center contracts around the relationship between the artist and the manager and the presenter. Then we wanted to look at tiered payments or deliverables uh, so that rather than doing away with this idea of deposits where it's money that you put on hold and then you take it back if the service isn't delivered at the performance date, it's recognizing that the artistic process starts from the moment even prior to contracting. And the artist, is do, artist and manager are doing work for that presentation very, very early on, not on the day of the performance, and that that work needs to be compensated. And then the final one was then looking at force majeure and cancellations. And we were very fortunate that Dance USA had a contact with the Stanford Law Group and working with Jay Mitchell, who was an incredible lawyer, and uh, explained to us, well, you know, force majeure, the, the clause is what the clause is. But if for your, the way you all do business, if that doesn't work, then change the clause. There's no one that says you, you have to keep that clause. So we did that. And um, so that was that group. And then there was the Creating New Futures group. That was a group that was spearheaded by artists, um, dance artists primarily. And our group, uh, the contracting group, was comprised of me as the agent manager, two presenter administrators, one in programming and one in production from Dance Plays, a technical director who had been a technical director for the Baryshnikov Arts Center, and one artist, a choreographer from San Francisco, Hope Moore. And we approached it in that, okay, Dance USA is already working on this and these things sound good, but how can we take it further? And so we used Dance Place, their contract, as a way to sort of do it as a case study and look at how do we look at this document from this organization as a moral document? 
how does this contract reflect the values of this organization in the way they want it to be reflected? And also, how does it support the artists that they're bringing? They brought, they bring early career artists to uh, very established artists, and so how does their contract help those artists understand what they're signing, understand the engagement that they're going into, and how are they responsible for ensuring that within their documents? That's awesome. Thank you. That was super, that was an enormous amount of content that happened over a long period of time. You yeah. boiled it down remarkably. Thank you for that. Um, quickly before me, we move on, from the work that you did at those, at those two organizations, are there any particular resources that you want to signpost us to? Yes. Uh, I forgot to mention that. So with Creating New Futures, there were the, we were invited because there were different groups working on different uh, topics on equity, uh, that there was a notes for equitable funding that had been formed and they invited us to contribute to that a section on how funding uh, for presentations could be more equitable between presenters and artists. And also, um, there was finally with Dance USA, we worked on a second phase with, uh, with Jay Mitchell to create a contract resource. We realized that we can't make a contract template that is equitable because every organization has unique needs. But we created this resource. We tried to make it as small as possible, but it's about four pages long. Um, but it's very helpful in, <clears throat> in sort of outlining sort of the things that that can go into a contract. And that document was uh, resourced and, and they researched all of the work that was being done over the last two and a half years on equitable contracting from the funding clause, from the creating new futures work, from blog posts. They just kind of took all of the information, researched it and created this document and said, here's a way that you can make your contract more equitable. That's amazing, thank you. And it is super interesting, and it's a fascinating document, um, for me, anyway. I, I like reading this stuff, it's how I entertain. Um, just quickly before we move on to your experiences with this whole process, Michael, is there anything anybody wants to add into to Sandy's narrative or uh, chronology of what transpired in those early days? No? Nope? Awesome. Um, Michael, in our conversation prior to this session, you really emphasized the importance of presenters using their power both in their relationship with artists, but also in the relationship with their institutions um, to encourage uh, the creation of relationships, not transactions, um, and to find ways to make the contracting process or the, the engagement process, more of an engagement rather than a transaction. Um, you wanna talk about that a bit? Sure, thanks, Matthew. Um, I wrote something down here. Contracts are just the tool that expresses the depth of a partnership. So with that thought in mind, as presenters, as presenters, we all have very different contexts. So I, I'm very aware of that as I say what I'm going to say. But um, know your context, know your environment, know where the workarounds may be. Because let's be honest, especially I'm at a state university, you have to use workarounds. You have to use different language. It's otherwise it's you against the attorney general of the state of Arizona on our part in our situation. Um, we have a sympathetic um, general counsel's office and we have a very good reputation on our campus. We do a lot for students and faculty. All of that feeds into our ability to use what I'll call workarounds. But uh, I also want to call out some folks in the field like uh, Shane Fernando at Cape Fear in North Carolina doing great work in this regard. Uh, Meany Hall, University of Washington their staff, Michelle Witt, uh, and I know there are others. So in regard to this, what we've always had in this field, there's, there's a power dynamic that's not balanced. Uh, and so as a presenter, you have the opportunity to, to look at that and, and really 
we are an ecosystem. We are a community that's interdependent. We do, my job doesn't exist if it's not for artists and managers. So I think that's really important for all of us, whether you've been in the field a long time or you're new to the field, to sort of revisit that thought and think about your conversations with every agent or manager are maybe ongoing long-term relationships with the best case scenario or will be. And in that context, as a presenter, I think it's important for us to do our homework about what are the real needs of this artist or agent manager and or this project. One size doesn't fit all. So very quick, simple nuts and bolts examples, but where we are, if I call something a commissioning, I get advance payment approved like that, no questions. If I call it uh, a payment for artist engagement, then you know the folks, the lawyers on campus say, no, you can only pay that the night of or right after. If you can attach it to research that's happening on campus, which oftentimes happens in a, in a project that we're co-producing with artists or agent managers and someone on campus, uh, then the advance payment is fine. There's no questions. Uh, anytime you can shift resources from, in this case, the pandemic, we were working with Rika and Lemon Anderson to produce a world premiere when aliens fall from the sky. When Lemon was supposed to come, he was our residency artist for a three year term, he couldn't come. So we shifted the residency uh, monies to commissioning work, essentially producing work so Lemon could do work on the new piece. Uh, so it's really, it, it's not one size fits all. It's know your environment, know your authorizing environment. What are those workarounds? Um, and making sure that from the first conversation you are really listening to the artist and the agent manager or producers who are vital to all of this happening. Uh, to translate in your mind at that first conversation, how can I do advance payments for this? Is it a remounting commissioning? You know, it really seems absurd. Uh, some of the language opens the door, but it's true when you're in a bureaucracy. So I'll just say that for the moment and love to chime in on other things. Just a quick response to that, maybe a question. Um, I feel like a lot of times when I'm working with larger institutions, there's the will to do things better, but then there's legal, which I take a certain amount of responsibility for, um, where it kind of all comes to a grinding halt. And I like the idea of the workarounds that you're talking about. Do you think there's a point at which legal will start to get what you're doing and mm -hmm. understand the importance and the policies will, like can we push the envelope either at, within one institution or can these move toward being best practices? So institutions where there isn't the kind of leadership that your institution has can start to point to, well, this is what Arizona does and mm. we all should be doing this. So thanks for bringing that up, Matthew, because I also, in my notes, I had written that um, laws are not stagnant. Our country's constitution has all these amendments to it from the original constitution. Laws have changed. These type of practices and laws can change. That happens exactly as you're saying. If I have, uh, so let's say University of Washington starts doing something, their state university, their attorney general of their state is technically their highest ranking attorney. If they starts to change something, then that gives me the opportunity to discuss it at our place and so on and so forth. So I think it's both and. I think it's um, if you have colleagues in the field achieving it, raise it up, use it as part of your conversation with your institution, um, that can help. Excellent, thank you. Is there any resources that you wanna signpost at this point? I'm sorry, I should have brought this up in the beginning, Enrica, maybe you'll touch on it more, but Rika Eno, the amazing Rika Eno, and, and I were asked by APAP early on in the pandemic, uh, to gather a group of really great thinkers in the field, and we had about 15 of them, to think about this issue. 
and think about solves and think about ways forward. And we did that over almost a year and created a doc document that I believe still sits on the APAP website, BEEP, Building Equitable Ethical uh, Partnerships. And that is a resource, I think, and like the amazing resources that came out of Dance USA and uh, Building New Futures. So I would definitely encourage you to look at that. There's, it's both nuts and bolts and philosophical that it touches on. Great. Um, shall I move on, or does anybody have any comments to that that they want to add? OK. Um, I'm glad you brought up Beep, because I think that sets us up for Suzanne talking about uh, Arts Forward, which if anybody was here for the last session, you've already heard some about that and you've got to listen to Suzanne. Um, with, Arts, with the Arts Forward grant and the Mellon Foundation and APAP took a bold, but I think very practical step toward creating a model for more equitable contracting relationships. Um, do you think the project succeeded? And what did you learn from the process? And do you see that becoming a model for other funding organizations uh, as, as a way of moving the needle toward more equitable practices. Mm -hmm. And last quick question, do you think that that's the direction change should come from, from funders? Mm -hmm. um, so I always wanna say I am a consultant. I work with a lot of organizations, including some funders, so I am not sitting in the seat of a foundation program officer to, you know, tell you about those kinds of opinions at that level. Um, success is a complicated word. I think rarely is it all, all or nothing. So we certainly learned some things in the process. Um, I do wanna say that what was crucial to us, I really, really have to give credit to um, all of the resources that were referenced. And um, I, I always like to call, um, to people's attention creating new futures because it had a big impact on our thinking along with Beep and Dan USA's work. So the challenge we set up for ourselves, and it was a challenge, was could we develop a more equitable payment structure within a national funding program and exude to the field that in fact it can be done? Again, not all or nothing, either it's done or not, but could we take one step moving in the direction of actualizing some of the things that had been put in documents. And um, uh, model also is a strong word. Emulate, suggest, illustrate some practices that the field could take hold of and move forward on. So many times when resources are created, we talk about them for years, and maybe, maybe the pace of, of um, action is slower than we would like. So that was the risk that APAP was willing to take. Um, we had some advisors that, that really helped us. So what I'd like to share with you in terms of our learning is something pretty concrete. How do we actualize in language um, what applicants were required to do if you got this funding, um, which allowed them to then talk with their institutions about what they had to do? Well. The, most of the grants were $50,000, and at least half of that, at least half, had to go to the artist. So that would be $25,000. Um, half of that fee to the artist had to be paid up front. What we did was we, we were able to give 80% of the funding to the presenter almost as soon as the notification went out about the grant. And we said, right after that happens, the artist needs to get half of their fee, that, so that 12,000 or 500. Um, we had them sign on to also that the artist needed to be paid, an artist, I hope you're listening to this, for their overall engagement, including any virtual activities. That the payment structure had to reflect mutually agreeable milestones, broadly speaking, that reflected work done at the time of the payment. So what this mu somewhat mundane language was meant for um, was that the artist couldn't be canceled on and asked to return money. And so the idea was to create um, a relational and emotional space going into those agreements that said, you're gonna get your money and you don't need to return it. We learned in the beginning of the pandemic 
from creating new futures, I've, some of those quotes are burned in my mind of just how incredibly devastating that was to artists. And so we were trying to create a different narrative. What we created, what we learned was that it worked for most people, but that this is not one size fits all work. It didn't work for every single situation and every artist. Thank you. Um, I think that it's, to me, the, the, the whole project is so exciting because it's so rare that, as you said, that things like that can happen so quickly. And it, um, the degree to which that project created, you, I don't know if you don't like the idea of model, but I think it's a model. It's a, it's a way of doing things. It was a proof of concept that everyone can see, and it's, that's incredibly important and powerful in, in this kind of conversation. Sure, I think we can go with maybe a model, just not the model. Okay. <laughs> um, are there any resources that, you've, that haven't been mentioned that you want to signpost? I, not that haven't been mentioned. Okay. Um, Rika. Hi. Yes, you Rika can. Share. Let me do a question first, and then I'll hand it over. Um, in our conversations prior to the session, you said that contracting is a way to build the mental muscle that moves our community toward a cult, toward cultural trans, a culture of transparency. Um, can you speak about that? And as an artist manager and creative producer, how you see this work moving our community's practices in a positive direction? What do you see as the next step beyond transparency? I want to just kind of help define transparency. In this work um, of equitable and ethical contracting um, working groups, we define it in, 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 in several ways. So engagement fees versus performance fees, we mentioned that. Um, multiple stages of fees and quote unquote deliverables, that was also mentioned, but I just want to break it down a little bit. Um, it, it's, it's about casting a w much wider net of what it means to deliver something and stages of work involved. So in our case, it could be planning meetings, all those Zoom calls, it's, it's work, right? Um, everybody has to get paid for that. Um, delivery of a, a tech writer. Imagine, that's actually a stage of delivery, delivery, especially for a new work. Um, and the and, and list goes on like that. Then there is talks about making the contract itself legible, um, more legible, so using a table format on page one, for example. Um, there's also um, a, a great need for mutual understanding of what it costs to do something. So there's a lot of education that can happen there, both on the presenter side and artist side and producer side. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that um, in the context of, of contracting, we're talking about transparency. But I also want to talk about the culture of transparency and sort of widening the definition of what it means to uh, lead, um, uh, to be a leader in sort of creating and, and fostering um, a cultural transparency. I think it's too myopic to say that let's just be ethical in contracting. I think it comes from a much deeper systemic place. So as a leader, are you asking yourselves, you know, are you an artist advocate? And what does that mean to then create a cultural trust within your organization first and foremost that then gets transpired into these different um, scenarios contractually? Um, so I think there has been even, you know, as recent as this week, um, we're, you know, in negotiation and, and we constantly see a kind of intention delivery gap, if you will. You know, there is um, beautiful dreaming going on about creating beautiful residencies with artists, um, thanks to Arts Forward. And then when it comes to contracting, it's like back to it, the way it was. And so I think there has to be, and it, it'll take time, we get that, but I think that now is a time with these resources in hand to try to create um, uh, first steps. What, what can you do? to create a more equitable and ethical um, environment in which we can all thrive. So I just wanna make sure that when we talk about transparency and trust that we're saying the same things. And it's certainly not one size and one definition fits all, so.
because I have a question for you. Um, when you're talking, so do you think that as the, oh, that makes sense. Um, do you think that this notion of transparency, um, admittedly one size doesn't fit all, but do you think that that's something that we are going to see a major evolution with in, in coming, do you think that, that our, the practices of our community have the capacity to grow into a place where there is more transparency and where there is this sort of uh, increased level of communication or are there systemic reasons why that just from business practices or capitalism or whatever it might be that there's a sort of we're going to hit a ceiling with that. I think there's steps being made. There's hopes, right? There's transparency in salaries, for example. Right. So, you know, lack of transparency at any level in any relationship or collaboration harms the sense of belonging and connection. So, again, to me, it's not contract, it's relationship. So, that's just the core of it. And so, Yes. Okay. That's great. Okay. <laughs> also, you mentioned something interesting um, before when we were preparing for this talk. You said lawyers are taught to that that contracts are only necessary when shit hits the fan. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> well, I like to think that it's the trust and transparency in relationship that have saved us from going legal to to going. For, for the shit to hit the fan. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a vital, it's a very tactile for us to, to experience that, right? That we do need the contract, but, but to avoid a legal discussion, we right. do need the trust and transparency. Yeah. Uh, it's also, you know, from the first thing you learn in contracts course in law school is that a contract is an, outlines an adversarial relationship. That's that's the way it's structured. And, but what's interesting about this conversation happening within the arts is this conversation has been happening for years and years in other fields as people try to figure out, as lawyers and their clients try to figure out how can we change that paradigm of an adversarial relationship? How can we use contracts to outline a collaboration? And there's decades of work being done on that. And I think that part of what's exciting about what's happening here is we're being able to draw, and I think this is what Stanford was doing to a certain extent, was like drawing on that, those traditions from other fields and bringing those practices into this one to make it, make it possible that you can have community statements that define the values that, go, that are under, underlying a contract. I'm talking and I shouldn't be, because Martha should be talking. Martha, do you have a mic? Yeah. Um, artists and their work are what this is all about, um, and artists' voices and the needs of artists are crucial to a community that is self-reflective, progressive, and empathetic. But this conversation runs the risk of casting artists as disempowered, um, which isn't the point at all. So I guess, what role do you think artists can and should play in moving our industry and our community toward more equitable practices? Um, Big I've question. been thinking about that question since you know, for a few days. And um, it goes back to what everyone has been saying on this panel. Um, Michael, you said it's about relationships. And um, it's the relationship with the artist and their agent or manager, the relationship between the presenters. Um, and also, you know, as an artist, we have a responsibility in all, in all of this to drive, to be the driving force into, um, you know, presenting the art that we want to express and that we want to share. And in order for that to happen, we have to be involved um, and, and do work just as much as everyone else. I mean, oftentimes I have, you know, some artist friends who, you know, at all different levels, from grassroots, like how I, how I am, and, you know, to like rock stars and, um, and a lot, um, both, uh, both ends of the spectrum, um, there are some artists who think that everything should be done for them and then they just show up with their work and then are surprised when certain things, oh no, we haven't done that, or no, this is, hasn't been done, or this, you know, so I think it really, um, 
it's crucial for the artists to be involved in making sure that these things are um, in place. And, you know, in all of the things that you say, the, you know, every step of, of the way that um, everyone is on the same page. And if that has to be with, you know, defining key, you know, marks, key marks, key points where um, certain parts of the project must be delivered by a certain time in order to get this compensation so that you can move forward. It's all about the conversation and about the relationship. And, um, and I'm in two minds because I do agree with um, Matthew and you know, that perspective of the contract is what you have when things go wrong. You know, that's at the very minimum. And, um, and it's true because I've, I've been in situations over you know, the 30 years that I've been in the business um, where the contract has been my save, saving grace, you know, when things have gone wrong. And, um, and it's, been, it's, it's been great to have that. And it's also, as also managing myself all this time. Um, it's important that, you know, I, I'm not just reading the contracts by myself. I'm working with my attorney as well, you know, who, and also, you know, the performing rights societies and, you know, and as a composer and a songwriter and things like that. So I'm in the u musicians' unions and things, you know, you, you use all the resources that you have available because they're out there for artists. Um, we can't just put our heads in the sand and just say we're going to be creative and I'm feeling very green today and I'm going to, you know, you can't just do that. <laughs> You know, and then decide, oh, I want to have like a, you know, a kind of Zeppelin floating in into my, th you know, how much is that going to cost? Oh, it's going to cost, you know, 150000 Well, can't we just do that, you know? <laughs> but these are things that happen with, I have artist friends who just dream, you know, I was driving in the car and yes, you know, I've been working on a score, you know, for, you know, 106 page score and then, you know, and then my, my you know, supervisor says, oh, I've been hearing this today. I think we should change everything to this, you know, after I've been working for four months on this, you know. So there are times when I think that if we're all on the same page at every step of the way, and that involves, you know, the artistic conversation, you have to, artists have to get involved and speak, and oftentimes we don't want to. Oftentimes we, you know, we don't want to be presented with the business side of things because it's, you know, it's intimidating, it's, it's um, overwhelming, and if, you know, if someone tells us no, we don't know how to, you know, handle that. So um, we have, you know, as artists, we have a responsibility to kind of, you know, be a grown-up and kind of do what we have to do to get our money and to get our work moving forward. So that's, you know, that's kind of my perspective on it. I, thank you. That's really useful and I, it also raises something I hadn't scripted um, which is I, I think that as artists become more powerful and have more leverage they don't have to worry about these things as much um, in many situations because the relationship draw no 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 but here's what I'm bear with me um, certain things become I'm just thinking about um, artists who have a lot more leverage in, in the marketplace um, that it, they don't, it becomes necessary. I think it, there's a responsibility that comes to that. Like I look toward the time when Billie Eilish tells Live Nation, I'm not gonna sign this contract if you don't change the, the, the force majeure clause. Cause that's where, you know, at that, that point, then we will have arrived with this conversation. Um, sort of, I, yeah, no, maybe not, maybe. But that, you, know, you get what I'm getting at. Yeah, I, I, I totally understand what you mean in, in that, you know, in that sense, but um, I wish everyone could could be like a Billie Eilish, but that isn't often the case. You know, the, there are some superstars who decide that, you know, everyone in the room should, you know, drink wheatgrass, wheat you know, and that's in the contract, or they can't be, you know what I mean? <laughs> so there's certain things you have to, you know, you know, we've had, you know, I've been in situations where that kind of stuff has gone completely um, you know, I can't name names, but, you know, sure. um, okay. where someone demanded that their dressing room be painted pink because they came in with a hot pink suit on, you know, and so everyone's running around painting the room pink, and by the time, you know, the room was painted hot pink, they changed their suit to blue and then said, 
that the pink was clashing with the blue and they couldn't see, so they had to change it and switch rooms. And then by that time, they switched the suit to red. And then the, you know, the, the boss came and said, look, we got it, this is ridiculous. So there comes a point where yeah. change can, make, can be good. Sure. Or it can be like completely ridiculous. I get it. Um, we're coming close to time here. I want to wrap up. I just want to mention a couple things that we've talked about in our conversations about where this can go. Um, we've talked about payment structures. We've talked about force majeure. But there's a lot more potential to this concept. There's a lot of ways that the things that we're thinking about in terms of making safer, uh, more fair, more equitable spaces, both physical and and, uh, and conceptual, these things can go in contracts. They can be things that we can use our contracts to enforce. And I think I challenge us all to kind of be thinking about how can we put teeth into our aspirations using the documents that we outline our, our relationships with. I also think that insurance is something that is a pain, but it also has a lot of potential to level playing fields um, by, by shifting where risk lands. That's a, he that's a whole other panel. Um, I want to give everybody a chance for closing comments, and then if we have time, we'll take some questions. Let's start at the end. Do you have anything you want to say to, to wrap up? Change is part of life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be a little longer. <laughs> um, I'm going to say that, um, although that's really it, um, I'd say that if you're interested in this, definitely go to the resources. Um, even for our own work in our own organization, using these resources and sharing them with our own lawyer that drafted up our uh, contracts was one step in having her understand where it was that we were coming from, and that's how she got it. All of these documents were written in a way so that you could, so that artists and managers could not only advocate for themselves when negotiating with presenters, but also so that presenters who are dealing within their own institutions can use that kind of language that the lawyers and the departments butt against. Um, so please read those, uh, read those resources if you're interested. There's a lot of useful information in that. And also that we've been working on this for two and a half years, and this is just the tip of the iceberg of where we really need to go. So encouraging everyone to continue to do this work. Um, bringing in those funders because that's where the money is and that's where the change is going to really, really happen. So funders that are in this room, please read these resources. Um, oh gosh, and this is, this is not easy. This is really hard. And even for presenters who want to implement this work, it's like, how do we do this when we don't have the resources and we don't have the money? Yeah, that's the next challenge. And so how are we all working together in the same way that all of these groups came together, the agents and the presenters, the technicians, the presenter, the artist, and the manager? We have to work as a community together to solve these problems. Don't go into your silos and say, I can't do this. Reach across the board and work. We are a community, and that's how we should be behaving. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add that I also um, feel that there should be um, there should be artist representation at every level, including the boardrooms of funding. Everything that's been said, and for my fellow presenters out there. I think it's not, it, there are some big things overcome, yes, but this is a daily practice. Mm -hmm. If I could just stress that one point, it's a little shift in habit. Mm -hmm. and do that extra work with your, uh, your general counsel's office on campus, or if you're a different kind of presenter, whoever your legal advisors are in authorizing an environment, board of directors, Make it a daily practice. And that starts with listening to the artists and the agent managers and producers. They say that behavioral change is 20% insight, like being inspired to do something, and 80% uh, 
um, muscles, building muscles, so yes to daily practice. Um, and I like to think of this process as kind of like a cooking show where we sit down and like look at the ingredients together, maybe even look at like farms where they come from and like cook together and make a meal together and eat together as opposed to sort of like, well, serve us your finished meal. Um, so let's cook really great meals together in transparent ways. There is also um, one um, resource that we're launching, rolling out soon. Uh, it's an explainer video. Um, it's like a two minute piece. Uh, you can share it for those of you who don't want to read words on paper. Um, that really clearly outlines the three principles that we've been kind of referring to. So that's going to roll out on APAP's website soon and on social media. So look out for that. Yeah. Um. To the people in charge, do we have time to take a question or two? No one says we can't, so let's do it. Yeah, right up in front. There's a mic right behind you if you want to grab that. I know time is short, overrun. Um, thank you for all this, by the way. Um, I work with a group of um, artists, and um, we were sort of going through that haggle of, you know, what is force majeure? We've tried to boil it down to a, a continued disruption for three months or six months, and now we find ourselves haggling about three months or six months with, with different um, uh, presenters and stuff. But the one thing that I, I was curious about is, what are you finding is the sort of generally acceptable language for force majeure now? My uh, a, a legendary lawyer that used to work with Peter Shukat used to tell me that whether your agreement is one page or 100 pages, there's nothing in that agreement that's gonna resolve an issue that the two parties don't actually get together and talk through um, before you go on to you know something else that's more expensive, more hateful. So I'm just curious, what are you uh, finding? And the other thing I was curious to take advantage of your um, place here, Matthew, and the visas, how long are you finding it's taking to get a visa now for um, bringing in international artists? Uh, I'll, we could talk about visas afterwards. I'll be here. Um, I think your original comment about force majeure is sort of what it is. I think that was Sandy, were you saying that? was that it is what it is, like it's a clause, and it's either in there or it's not. Um, I think that's kind of true to a certain extent. The question is, have you already paid the artist the other phases before the force majeure clause is, is enacted? That would be one way to do it. You could rewrite the clause itself to be more specific about pandemic or not, but you know, it's a cancellation clause, and what triggers it and what doesn't. So I think what yeah. you guys have been focusing on is, what happens and are we people are are people getting paid for the work that they do up until the point where that happens we had been doing some modifications though also to the okay. force majeure clause itself and we've been seeing it in certain presenters contracts as well okay um that uh the force majeure clause sometimes say that yes you know that's going to happen but we will um some in some instances it says that this, a force majeure does not mean an immediate termination of the contract, and also that both parties will continue to work together to try to reschedule the engagement. Right. Um, so we do have sample language in the resources that have been implemented by certain presenting organizations and artists. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, Boo. Hi, thank you all so much for this. Could you do a very quick rundown on where people can find these resources online? Yeah. Oh, we have to stop right now? Yes. Yes. The beep document on, uh, on the APAP website is a place to start. It has all of the links to all oh. of these resources, so you awesome. just read through it. So go to the APAP website, B-E-E-P. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.